What's up, everyone? This is Cheech back here again with another episode of Chicharito. I know I've been, you know, being a mist for MIA, you know, for probably around two to three weeks. But trust me, I've been spending a lot of time, you know, apart from my daily job. I've been trying to make sure, you know, this video here doesn't disappoint you. And, you know, hence, I'm actually putting in more time as compared to my typical videos in making this stock assessment. So, without further ado, what is the T-Rex of the stock market? Something which is ancient, something which is, you know, not really talked about, you know, for like a couple of years or maybe, you know, even five years. So, drum roll, and it's actually, yes, for those of you who still eat this biscuit or your parents have it in your house in that container, you know, this old-fashioned style containers. It's Hapsing Industries per heart. That is right, folks. Now, before we move on to the juicy bits, I hate to say this, but I've got to come up with a disclaimer, you know, because this is not a recommendation to buy or sell the stock. Although, you know, uh, I have a vested interest in this, I actually have a allocation of my portfolio to this. But that's it. Yes, we don't want to go to the court, ladies and gentlemen. It is not a place we want to be at. So, what are we going to be reviewing in terms of, you know, hubsing, you know, the whole company? There's just so many things that we can explore, you know. We can take a whole day, weeks, or months, but, you know, I'm trying to compress this such that, you know, you get a good idea or some rough knowledge on, you know, to make some sound investment decision. So, for the overview of this video, we'll be going through five parts. So instead of your, you know, common boring names you see in like financial reports, I'm going to come up with like a, a something more, you know, more chill, more relatable, you know. So the first part is going to be on the business. So it's more like an introduction on, you know, what they do, the business model, uh, how's the market segment like, and what's the future outlook of it. The overseers here are like, you know, the bosses, like the people, you know, the, the, the I would say like the gods or something, like gods of Olympus. Uh, they are like, you know, helming the upper post, you know, managing the company, determining how the company should go ahead in the future, and you know, what are the uh, strategic measures they're taking to uh, actually handle current as well as future prospects. The moolah here refers to the money, which is the financials, you know, how do they make money, uh, where are they using up the money for, and you know, are they doing well? in terms of you know generating money alarm bells you know as the name uh, says is, is like to do with whether the company actually has any warning signs that we need to be you know careful about and the last one is of course the valuation yes i do not have any cool names for this so do comment if you've got any cool name that you can put under this section but this is basically the part where i talk about you know what is my current valuation on this stock uh, based on uh, my preference of you know valuing it so yeah, let's deep dive into Hapsing and see what they have got to offer. For the first section, which is the business, we're going to look at the company structure first. So, do take note that uh, this detail here has been, I mean, this diagram here has been taken from the uh, 2018 annual report because the 2019 one hasn't been uh, announced or released so far on their website. So we'll have to, like, you know, use this as a benchmark for now, but I don't think, you know, the business model is going to change drastically, you know, seeing how it's already pretty established. So, uh, the holding company, or rather, you know, the parent company is called Hapsing Industries Berhad. As you can see here, the top one, which is in green, and there are three subsidiary companies under it, the ones in pink. You've got Hapsing Perusahaan Makanan M, Sundaram Bahad, Hapsing Hunyong Brothers, Sundaram Bahad, and In Comics Food Industries, Sundaram Bahad. If I'm not mistaken, based on my memory, you can check, I believe the uh, Hapsing Perusahaan Makanan is in, in charge of the uh, production, the manufacturing of the biscuit, and uh, the other one, Hunyong, will be more in charge towards the sales and marketing part. But, you know, it could be the other way around. I'm not sure, but yeah, I do know these two are in charge of those two major components. In comics, on the other hand, will be to do with the uh, beverage side of it, of Hapsing. Moving on to the product range, you know, as mentioned earlier, they do biscuits. So under their biscuit range, I'm pretty sure you've seen this, you know, in your supermarkets like Aeon, Tesco, you know, places like these, Hapsing cream crackers, uh, the whole range of it, I think, you know, everyone's like, pretty used to it, except for, like, I guess, the middle and the right one, you know. Probably you guys aren't, you know, 
uh, not aware that you know this brand called Kirk, you know, as well as Natural actually belong to Hubsing as well. Interesting, is it? Seeing how they're actually uh, going into the uh, health segment, right? You know, biscuits which are healthy, like oat cookies and things like that. things which are you know uh, detrimental to health, like things which are rich in sugar and things like that. Moving on to beverages, where I talked about in comics a while ago. So you can see, it's actually focused on instant uh, beverages. So basically, these are sachets where you open up, it's in powder form, you pour it in, you put some hot water, and you can drink it. I've actually personally tasted it myself. It's actually okay. I wouldn't say it's like in the upper range of very, very good, you know, but it's decent. It keeps you satiated, and you know, you get, you get something warm and nice to drink. The last part will be the other Asian products. So these would be your typical uh, Wang Wang uh, products because they actually emphasize this in the uh, annual report. So it's like your sesame crackers, rice crackers, as well as this drink. Uh, it's a milk drink apparently, but I don't think I've really seen that before. So yeah, these three are their main product range categories. So now that we have like you know familiar with how the company structure is and what kind of products they sell, we're gonna move on to the market segmentation of this company. Uh, so the market is split into the domestic side and the export side. So domestic, as you know, their sales in Malaysia, as you can see from the year 2014 to the year 2018, it's always hovering around the range of around you know, 70s uh, percent. And the export, you are seeing how the domestic didn't change much. So as a result, the export market doesn't change much as well. So it's been around between the 26 to 28, uh, 29 percent range, yeah, around there. And moving on, we can also see that you know they actually have an international presence in more than 40 countries. You know, right? I mean, even I myself couldn't believe that actually like present in so many countries around the world. And I thought you know Hap Singh is just like a you know, old school name that you don't really hear that much anymore these days, right? But yeah, turns out they actually uh, export to 40 countries, and the top five exported countries are Thailand. Saudi Arabia, Singapore, Myanmar, and Indonesia, which actually constitutes 58% of their total export revenue. And they actually have 60 agents and distributors to ensure their products are marketed properly overseas. How interesting is that? So remember how you know, I was talking about the product segment just now, but you know we do not know like what's the percentages like you know for that like, biscuit, beverage, and other products. So this uh, paragraph here actually describes that clearly. It's in the annual report as well. As you can see, 95% of sales actually comes from their biscuit range. Beverages, on the other hand, takes up the remaining, uh, no, sorry, beverages and other agents' products. So that's like 5%, very small. So I guess uh, it's not surprising that their beverages aren't tasting too well based on my comment just now. But yeah, this gives you a good idea no? on whether how their market is actually segmented in terms of their product range as well as, you know, geographically as in how much is split between domestic and export. Now, when we talk about business as well, we want a business which actually has set economic moat so when I say moat, you know, imagine like it's a castle and it's surrounded by water, right? And you need a drawbridge to cross over, right? You know, for your enemies to cross over to attack you. So this moat is to actually prevent your competitors from like penetrating into your business, you know, and taking up your, you know, your share of the market. But in the case of Hub Singh, right, there's actually not an economic moat I can find. Therefore, what I've come up with are like competitive advantages they have. So they are competitive in that sense, but you know, it, it still doesn't mean that it's like a formidable mode that, you know, it can be used against the competitors. Uh, anyhow, the first one that I think would be to do with the strong brand presence. Uh, this is because if you were to actually go ask people in around their 40s age or 50s age, they actually still have, you know, these tins of biscuits at home, like the Hapsing brand. Or even like you know they have like their normal plastic container but they're still buying the uh normal hubsing biscuits in the latest packaging and just refilling it in inside uh apart from that as well actually if you were to do like a rough google online i think they had like a scandal last time was it like a few years back online you know people burning a biscuit and you know, they're like 
films or something created about it. But you know, there's still lots of people actually you know supporting this brand. So if you actually go through like the comments on social media, you actually see uh youngsters, you know, in their twenties or thirties, you know, still still actually relating closely to this brand. Because the thing is that you know these viscous actually help them throughout, you know, maybe their university studies or you know when they start out working, you know, budgeting for their meals. So it's like a, it's like something that you know which is staple to a certain segment of society. I mean, there's no data supporting their strong brand presence as far as I know. Uh, if you can find one, that's good. But what I see is that it actually still uh, remains as a brand which is pretty well known in everyone's mind. Moving on from there. They actually have a negotiating power on their raw material. So about this, actually, uh, I can't find any spotting data online. But based on people who I've known, you know, who went to the AGM and you know, hearsay from the, the seasoned investors, what I do know is that, uh, I mean, this is based on your own prerogative and the untrust or not. But yeah, uh, what they say is that Housing uh, actually uh, moved on from their ways of using uh, to leverage in their business, but rather you know, they believe in like fully using cash flows to actually you know maintain their company performance. So it is because of their use, I mean their primary use of cash in their business, they're able to negotiate power on in terms of the pricing of the raw material, you know, which could be like oil, the flour, things like that. In a way, Hapsing doesn't really have like a, you know like a super big barrier of entry, like something like a force field to block the competitors from coming into the market. That's why you see like a lot of biscuit, you know, competitors like Munchies, uh, Hua Tai, uh, brands like these actually taking up some of the market share. So moving on to the current versus future outlook. So how does the company look like, you know, today as well as in the future? Let's go on with some uh, excerpts that we actually got from the Edge, which is a reputable uh, platform media for uh, news to do with businesses. So the first thing to note here is that uh, Hapsing has actually uh, temporarily benefited from COVID-19 pandemic because you know, consumers will be stocking up in terms of like uh, low-cost goods to go through this time because they may be facing unemployment, salary cuts, you know, things like that. So when time's not doing good, you know, people will go for biscuits, you know, as their meals, you know, maybe for breakfast, lunch, and maybe a bit for dinner. And also, despite it being a uh, class for undergrad, essential goods, you know, where they were actually allowed to operate during the MCO, uh, apparently there were like operational restrictions. So this actually limited like the amount they could produce, thus, you know, pro probably uh, reducing their revenues for the current quarter. Moving on from there, they actually plan to strengthen their product quality, expand the product portfolio range, maybe you know, just apart from beverages and biscuits, they want to mention something else, improving their cost management, maybe in terms of like you know, factory production, sales marketing, and things like that, as well as broadening its distributor network, which means uh, partnering with you know various sales or marketing partners to uh, get their biscuit to other countries or other uh, locations within the country. So, one thing to note about uh, Hubsing is that, as I mentioned earlier, they actually have a lot of competitors. The barriers of entry to this industry is not so huge such that you, know, you can stop people from coming in, hence making the whole market saturated with competition. So, due to the saturation of competition, you know, so everyone's able to come in, everyone's able to offer almost the same product, uh, you can only charge so much in terms of the pricing. Hence, they can pass on fully this advertising costs to their consumers. But then again, if you were to look at the financials in terms of the gross profit margin, uh, this tends to be the other way around. We will see this in a while more. So yeah, be patient with that. Okay, we're kind of clear of you now of what's happening now during COVID-19, as well as we know how the market is known as pretty saturated and how it affects what I'm saying. Let's look at what the future prospects hold for them. So one thing to note here is that Hapsing actually invested in an oven which costs 12.1 million ringgit from Italy. Yeah, and then they're expecting their production capacity to increase by 15% from 33,000 tons per year. And it's expected that waste stage will be actually reduced from 4% to 3%. So I actually found two articles that support this, one from Busa Marketplace and the other one from the Edge Markets. And for the Edge Markets, what's actually added on 
uh, apart from what's mentioned about wastage, it actually improves their quality of production. The hygiene is also safer for the environment. Uh, last but not least, it's expected that their utilization rate will actually be more than 90%. Well, the thing is that I don't really have like a benchmark to gauge, you know, what the utilization rate is, you know, for the biscuit industry. I'm not in it. Uh, I actually went to check Hua Tai's one, but I can't really find it even by, you know, Control F to find the utilization keyword in your annual report. But I think that, you know, uh, generally or reasonably above 90% of a utilization rate would be considered reasonable or good, right? I would think you would think so too. So, what does this mean in a nutshell? This effectively means that, you know, with this new oven, they increase their production capacity, they reduce their wastage. As a result, efficiency increases. Efficiency here uh, referring to the utilization rate. Hence, with all this clumped together, we would expect Hubsing to actually generate more sales, more revenue, and, if, and in effect, more profit. You know, provided that they, they keep their costs at the same level or they you know, reduce the cost based on this uh, new oven efficiency. So now that we're clear, you know, what this oven investment means for Hubsing in terms of their uh, increase in efficiency and utilization, let's move on to another aspect of things. So the first one I'd like to point out is to do with the China market, which they're actually exploring. So we know that the Chinese market formed 2.6% of the group's total revenue. Uh, but management is being ambitious about this. They want to have at least a 20% growth in the Chinese market, you know, knowing how China is one of the largest markets in the world, you know, as compared to like the other big giants like US. Hence, they're actually uh, putting a brief front on this. They are utilizing the cost strength, which is to do with crackers and sandwiches, you know, since we mentioned earlier that, you know, this product segment actually caters to 95% of their total revenue and also the supporting listing fees and campaigns which means that you know they're trying to subsidize the uh, fees which is presumably for the distributors i assume uh, hence to actually increase their global outreach to the markets overseas uh, apart from that there's actually uh, a local fund manager that actually you know got in contact with the edge and also you know had a comment on uh, hub saying saying that you know with the increase uh, in like business costs to do you know with raw material over time and also with Hubsing not adjusting their selling prices since 2011 this may be an issue so they actually are foreseeing that Hubsing will actually you know uh, raise the price to pass on some costs to the consumers hence making them less competitive and a last minor note will be to do with you know the weakening of the ring gate actually helping Hubsing now why does it help Hubsing because uh, if you know the ring gate does weaken uh, so the export sales will be a larger conversion in terms of uh, the uh, reporting of sales and profit seeing how you know their sales and profit are reported in the ring gate amount so that is all for part one, the biz. I hope your head is still, you know, clear and sane enough to absorb more info because we're moving on to part two, the overseers, the bosses, the gods, the whatever you call it at the top, monitoring what is to be of the company. So who are they? Yes, we have 11 people on the board of directors, Hub saying. All of them are experienced people in their respective fields. Six out of eleven have familial ties, so they're related to each other. So these six, which I'm referring to, I actually bolded, as you can see, which is you know Dr. K, Kirk Chuko, Kirk Chu Song, Ko Chu Song, Jolite, Kirk Han, and Kirk Chen Tong. And yes, if you want to understand what their backgrounds are and you don't trust me in terms of my evaluation, please do go read up their biographies in the annual report. Trust me, they're all there. Like, super experience in their fields so i think there's nothing to be denied about this so let's move on so what is director's remuneration so the remuneration is a benefit you know that the board of directors receive as being part of the board so what do they receive there are five items there's salaries and bonuses other emoluments there's like other items defined contribution plan which I would assume is EPF by the end of that, uh, fees and benefits in kind. So 
the company column refers to just Hap Singh Sindram Bahad, whereas the group refers to the combination of you know all the subsidiary companies under it. So in this case, we can see that the uh, directors uh, benefit if we were to consider as a group, you know, when I see the total, it's actually 11.47 million, which is actually a huge chunk. Now, how do we evaluate you know, whether it is a relatively huge amount? Simple, we compare it to the net profit of that particular uh, financial year. So, seeing how we have access to the 2018 uh, financial report or annual report, we find that it's actually 19.85. 0.85% of their net profit, which is actually quite large, right? If you think about it, that's like one fifth. But anyhow, we'll analyze the financial statements further to see you know, how they're doing in terms of their financial health, right? So let's move on to director's interest. Now, when I say interest here, it's to do with the uh, shareholding percentage in the company itself. So as you can see in this table, there's actually two different interests, which is direct and deemed. So direct interest will be a direct shareholding of that particular director and company. So in this case, as you can see, for example, let's take uh, Dato uh, K or Kripchuko. So he actually has a 0.91% stake in the company, a direct one. So that means that this 0.91% is listed under his name directly. And we also see the deemed interest of his, which is 0.59%. Now, this 0.59% is considered attributable to him. So, um, I didn't explore deeply into uh, the calculations that resulted in this, but what I do understand is that this 0.59% result in a way uh, such that maybe Dr. K or Kirk actually owns another uh, subsidiary company uh, that owns Hub Singh, hence giving it a deemed interest as in, you know, there's an attributable interest because you know something which is affiliated to him actually owns a percentage of Hapsing as well. Hence, you know, giving the uh, how do I put it, giving the deemed effect or the perceived effect that you know he actually has more interest than his you know direct holding interest. You know, so basically, just to summarize, you would have you know directors who have a direct holding of the shares, but it could be you know in a way indirectly holding interest through some other affiliate associate or company which owns the share if you get what i mean so yeah i hope that is clear to every one of you let's go on to the top shareholders you know in hub Singh. so for this info you can actually check out their annual report as well the info is there under this section they'll tell you who are the top 30 shareholders of the group so hsb groups in your heart uh, is the ma majority shareholder in this case, you know, to make the decisions and things like that. So they hold a stake of 51%. Other key notable uh, shareholders of Hub Singh would be, you know, EPF, yeah, Employees Provident Fund. you got Norges Bank. Norges Bank, I believe it's a European uh, bank based in, was it Sweden or the Netherlands? Yeah. And you also have Tokyo Marine, one of the insurance companies. And of course, you have like an array of, you know, the core family members owning a certain percentage directly under their name, you know, like uh, Kirk Chuko, Kuo Chi Ching, Kirk Chen Tong, and so on. As you can see as well, yeah, they actually make up a whole bunch of the list up to number 30. So now that we're done with the rather boring bits of you know a lot of names, directors, things like that, let's move on to the juicier bits once again, which is the mula, which is the money, right? So first things first, uh, instead of actually diving deep into the financial statements, I've decided to actually you know highlight key ratios to you guys so that you can uh, see what are the rather important parameters that you can actually, you know, go through firsthand before you actually explore any company. So uh, for Hubsing itself, I actually use uh, an app called the VI app. It's called the Value Investing app. So I actually subscribe and pay for it. And of course, it actually uh, summarizes all the data in chart form. It also, it actually tabulates all the data in uh, value form as well. So, you know, for 2010 to 2019, it tells me the value for each year. But the thing is that charts actually help me to make a, a faster decision on whether I need to uh, deep dive into the company itself and spend more time with it. But yeah. 
to for this part here i'd like to highlight these three things which is the gross margin net margins as well as return equity just to briefly uh, explain it, gross margin will be to do with their gross profit margin. So it will be like a percentage of the sales amount. So gross margin of 34% will mean that for every 100 ringgit of sales that they make, they actually make a 34.01 ringgit of gross profit. And net margin would be almost same as gross margin, uh, sorry, as gross margin, but it will be net profit margin. So in this case, it will mean that for every hundred ringgit sale that they make, they're actually making eleven ringgit in net profit. So net profit here would be equivalent to gross profit minus of any other administrative expenses. Whereas you know, gross profit will be to do with the uh, sales of the good minus of the costs in making the good. So this cost can be you know, labor, uh, electricity, things like that. So one is more towards, gross will be more towards the uh, making of the good itself, as net margin will be more towards like administrative, sales, marketing, and things like that. And moving on to the last ratio, which is the return on equity. So what this means is that this will be the capability of the company to generate returns with an amount of money. So a uh, return on equity or ROE of 22.15% means that for every 100 ringgit of equity that the company has, they are able to actually generate you know, a net income of like 22.5 ringgit. So yeah. That is the explanation for the ratios. So let's run on to the key highlights. So I have to point out that Hapsing actually has reasonable pricing power with this gross profit margin of 34.1%. Why do I say so? Because we are in the biscuit industry, so it's fair to say that we have to do a comparison to our competitors within the same field as well. So in this case, I actually picked Hua Tai, which is also a pretty popular brand. As you may have known, they actually produce uh, biscuits called Luxury. I think you know about it, right? And yeah, actually, I actually wanted to take Munchies as an example, but the thing is, Munchies uh, isn't listed. I don't think their parent company is listed as well. I tried checking. But yeah, do let me know if they are. <laughs> uh, moving on to that, efficient cost management as well is observed in Hapsing. Why do I say so? Now, instead of actually uh, looking at just biscuit industry, I was curious you know, as to how Hapsing would actually perform as compared to the companies in the S&P 500. So for those that do not know, S&P 500 is actually standard and poor 500. So they are like the top 500 companies in the US in terms of market capitalization. So, you know, I was thinking that, I mean, even Warren Buffett say that if you are lazy to do any form of research, you might as well just throw your money into the S&P 500 index. So if if you are able to find an individual company that can outperform the index, then of course, you know, it's like a worthy company to go deep dive and research into more depth with. So, as can be uh, seen or Google online, I actually found that for the S&P 500 companies, the average, as in the average of these 500 companies in terms of their operating profit margin is actually 1% lower than Hub Singh which shows that Hapsing is actually efficient in managing its costs in terms of you know administrative expenses and other other expenses which are not related to the making of the product. Uh, another thing to note here is how efficient they are in utilizing their capital. So for the average uh, ROE return equity in the S&P 500 is actually 6% lower than Hapsing's. Now how great is that? Hapsing is are actually 6% higher than the S&P's ROE and at the same time they're actually able to maintain that ROE you know, stably like within the range of probably around 18 to around 30% so it's actually pretty crazy right? So that is all for the income statement ratio. Moving on to our next financial document that we want to explore will be the balance sheet. So for this, it's the same thing as the previous slide. I got the data from VAP. And for this part as well, I'll be highlighting a few key ratios which I think are important to have a quick glance through. So the three things would be current ratio, cash ratio, and total debt to equity. Now, what is current ratio? Current ratio would be the ratio of the current assets that the company has to the current liabilities that it has. Cash ratio would be to do with the amount of cash that the company has to the amount of current liabilities that the company has. So in a way, cash ratio is like current ratio, but you're just considering the amount of cash. Total debt of equity, like 
to equity would be like the name says, you know, ratio of total debt to total equity that the company has. So for current ratio of Hub Singh is 1.96, which is actually almost two times its current liabilities. So this shows that, you know, if Hub Singh needs to pay off its current liabilities, it's got more than enough in terms of current assets to actually pay it back. And it's in fact better than Hua Tai, which is, uh, which is only 1.25 times. It's got a very superb cash ratio as well, 1.14. So to say that, you know, if some of Hub Singh's current assets aren't able to tank off, you know, any of the liabilities left, its cash is actually, you know, sufficient enough to pay it all off. And Hua Tai only has 0.26, which means that it's got insufficient cash to actually pay off its short-term commitments or liabilities. And the last thing to note is that Hub Singh has zero debt. Now, uh, I'm not too sure whether it's changed or not, you know, since I last checked the data, but, you know, Hub Singh has been known as a company that, you know, that doesn't like debt because of its experience in the past where I think it almost gone into bankruptcy due to its leveraging of debt. And hence, you can see why the graph for total debt equity is pretty flat. So, with zero debt, Hub Singh is able to maintain, you know, no risk of defaults. Hence, you know, making it very sturdy and resilient throughout COVID-19 or any other, you know, economic repercussions that, you know, be caused by COVID-19. Moving on to our last financial statement, you know, for this section would be the cash flow statement. And we're looking once again at three key ratios of the cash flow. And this data is, of course, from the app itself. So what is cash from operations? Cash from operations here refer to cash which is generated from the company's operations and, you know, and not from other things like the company putting in FD or the company selling off a property or things like that. But you know, in Hub Singh's case, it's just generated from the sales of biscuits, beverages, and you know, other Asian products. CAPEX here refers to capital expenditure, you know, so basically uh, how much investment do we have to invest in you know, for like you know remember the ovens, the drop of one million oven, you know, any machines, production line, things like that. Uh, basically uh, investments that they have to make, you know, from time to time to ensure that the business is sustained. And the last thing would be the free cash flow. So this is the amount of cash flow left after, you know, we have considered the cash that Hub Singh has to use to, uh, for financing operations, for investment operations, and their working capital. So basically it's cash, which, you know, they can use for anything at all, basically. So, how is their cash flow for operations? As you can see in the green graph, it's actually increasing rather stably. There's, you know, there's no signs of it, you know, like having like a big dip or anything like that. Uh, what else? They actually have low to moderate capex. As you can see, you know, throughout 2010 to 2019, there's only just like, you know, some dips in 2016 and 2019. I'm not sure about 2016, but 2019 was due to the oven, as we see last time, that, uh, that at the end of 2018, they were considering an oven, you know, and then installing it. And after the installation, then it would result in like the utilization of this oven, which actually justifies the investment of this capex. Last thing would be the rather stable free cash flow that we're seeing here. I mean, there were like spikes and dips, but you know, overall, as you can see, it's mostly like either rising or, you know, it's hovering between the 20 to 40 million ringgit range, which actually makes sure that, you know, uh, you get consistent dividend payouts. Uh, this dividend thing is like a, something I like to drop more in the further slides. So yeah, stay tuned for the section after this. Now, why did I mention about dividend just now, right? Because the thing about Hub Singh is that if you can see in this dividend chart here, which I actually obtained from MalaysiaStock.biz website, you can see that actually even though you know they had wow like you know numerous dividend amounts back then, it's like 12 cents, 25 to 30, but it dropped to 4.5 cents in uh, 2014. But for the past five years, they're actually able to maintain a constant dividend flow of six cents. So that's actually pretty good, you know, five years of track record. I mean, if you would count 10 years, because, you know, the other six years were actually like even higher than six years, you could see that they actually have a track record in ensuring that every year you have some form of dividend coming in. Uh, apart from that, do note that in actually the dividend payout ratio had been above 100%. But that's only been for the past three years. Now, what is the dividend payout ratio? Basically, the dividend payout ratio is the amount of dividend that 
Hap Seng is paying as a portion of their net income. So you know, after the net profit and things like that, so uh, they have like some money left. So they actually paid, like, you know, sometimes above hundred percent. So basically, what they did was that you know, apart from using net profit, you know, from that particular financial year, they actually used money from like you know the past year, which was you know uh, retained to actually distribute as dividends to shareholders. Now, I'm not too sure why they're doing this, but you know, it it in a way shows that you know they have the uh, confidence that they are able to like you know give more value to shareholders throughout this a uh, more than hundred percent dividend payout ratio. But this is just my point of view. Do you know? Let me know if you have any other thoughts uh, in regards to this uh, extraordinary dividend payout ratio. So I know that you know we have seen like, a lot of good stuff right about Hap Singh. Now let's look at some of the alarm bells, you know, the red alerts, the signals, the warnings. So what's the first one here? First one here will be the saturated marketplace, as we have seen earlier, like how analysts have put it, like you know, they are in a very crowded marketplace. You got brands like Jacobs, you got Munchies, you got Julie's, you got you know Danone, Jacobs, Kraft, things like that. And it's just so many competition out there. If you can see in this uh, basic Google that I've done, like most of the biscuits are around their price range at like three ninety one, but you know some of them are like four, uh, you know some of them are like around eight as well, you know. So as you can see, uh, even with competitors having such a high price, and people are still buying the product. So you know, Hapsing uh, at the end of the day faces super stiff competition, and you know whether they can survive in the marketplace in the next five to ten years remains a big question mark. Secondly, it would be to do with the incubation time of new biscuits, because uh, I put it as common knowledge here. Because thing is that uh, think about how you know how you would want to actually uh, scale up the mass production of biscuit. You would have to go through a very very long and time consuming phase, all the way from you know market survey, market research, R and D, find a perfect taste, the perfect texture. Then you have to try and run it in factory lines to ensure that everything's okay, safety wise, you know, the levels are all okay as well, before you release it to the market. You know, like easy to say it's probably gonna take a minimum of one year just to develop you know a biscuit range. That's why you don't see like a lot of brands coming out with you know tons and tons of biscuit uh biscuit flavors or biscuit types. Apart from that, we have to consider like raw material price fluctuations as well. Because over the years, you know, uh, the thing about commodities is that they always fluctuate, you know, with regards to economic news or economic conditions like the COVID-19 situation that we're facing now. Seeing how uh, biscuits require oil, flour, uh, fuel, things like that. So Hapsing is susceptible, you know, to these kind of price fluctuations which affect their costs and at the end affect their bottom line, which is their profits. Last would be forex effects, you know, as we have also seen in the previous analyst comments where, you know, uh, with a change in like the uh, weakening or the strengthening of the ringgit, this will affect like Hub Singh's export sales and thus, you know, their uh, underlying profits. So now that we have known, you know, what the alarm bells are, let's move on to the valuation. And yes, I'm still looking for a cool name for the section. So do comment below if you've got anything worthy enough, you know, to replace this title here. So I'm going to value it based on a very simple model, which is the expected dividend yield. Why? It is a income generating stock. Now, when I say income, it's more like a passive income. So think of it like it's like an FD, but with risk. It's got a stable share price and it's got a business model, which works well in all climates. Climates referring to economic climates. Think about it. It's biscuit, it's low price. People will buy it normally, you know, if they want to have it for their breakfast or something like that. And in tough times, people would also buy it because, you know, they want to save costs, they want to save on their living allowances. So, what do I have to back myself up? So, I wouldn't know, you know, how Hub Singh will perform in this COVID-19 situation. So, I actually went back to 2009 because it was the year, you know, after the, uh, one of the crisis back then, 2008 was the really subprime, subprime crisis in the US. So, in 2009, as you can see here, uh, Hub Singh actually had a comment with to do with the recession, you know, where they actually experienced a 3% decrease in their revenues. But, you know, even with this 3% decrease in revenue, they actually had a profit jump of 68%. That's crazy, right? But yeah, that's it. I think that this business, uh, in a logical or common sense aspect, is that people would still actually you know, buy biscuits you know, 
even in this point of time, right? Because it's just cheap biscuits, you know, where it enables people to survive through the economic turmoil. And apart from that, uh, even with the economic impacts felt, you know, through the 2008 subprime crisis, they actually still proceeded with a uh, policy where, you know, they promised a 60% of their net profit of the tax as dividend payout. So this is basically 60% guaranteed dividend payout ratio from housing, provided you know, it doesn't affect their company in any way. You know, if they are still able to pay it out, they will still pay out 60% of it. And apart from that, we have also some other analyst comments from the edge as well, where you know, they mention of how the dividend yield has been you know, at a decent level of 5 to 5.5%. It has got a strong track record delivering. This is also supported by you know, the chart that I showed you earlier, where you know, for the past 10 years, they have actually been giving out dividends for that. It wasn't one year in a 10 year range where the dividend was zero. And of course, it doesn't have any borrowings, which means that they are generating a lot of cash flow, which they are constantly using, you know, for their capex, for dividends, and maintaining their competitiveness in the market. And also, just to highlight the uh, growth rates for the past 10 years, if we were to like uh, uh, compound average it, so basically the Kager uh, for the latest 12 months for 2019, quarter 4, would be 3.79% uh, for revenue. I mean, that's okay for a dividend stock because we're looking for stable companies providing dividends. Operating profit growth of 4.08% per year, that's actually pretty good as well. Net income growth of 4.3% as well as a diluted earnings per share growth of 4.3%. As you can see, over the long term period, Hapsing actually grows slow. But the thing here to note is that it grows slow but it provides you a sustainable form of dividend. So if you are the kind of person you know, that un, 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 but that is susceptible you know, to volatility and you're not comfortable with that, then perhaps Hapsing is a good choice in terms of like providing you that you know that safe space to actually start off your investment uh, and also for the long run where you know it provides you constant dividends. Now that we've like explored the uh, concept and the reasons behind why I like to use the dividend yield uh, valuation for Hapsing. Let's move on to you know how I would calculate it, you know, if I would buy it. I mean I bought it, but you know, let's just go through it. <laughs> so this is just a Google chart, you know, that I've gotten from Google, but it's just to show you that you know Hapsing is relatively stable. Like even from 2019 to the current uh, year itself, it's only got a change of around 1%. That's why I say it's pretty stable. Now the general FD rate before COVID-19 was around 3% per annum, roughly around there, right? You get like 3.2, 2.9, 2.8, things like that. Now, I want a minimum rate, which is double of that. So this would differ from person to person. But my personal preference is that, you know, if it's not like incredibly huge as compared to FD, why would I want to invest in stocks, right? Because it's risk attached to it. So I actually have a personal requirement of 6% per annum in terms of dividend yield if I want to invest in a dividend stock. Uh, likewise, if you think you know it needs to be seven or eight or nine percent, you can always tweak this according to your requirement. And we know that dividend yield is equals to the dividend received over the share price. Now, assuming that you know Hapsin can still provide a dividend of six cents per year, you know, for this year or even upcoming years after COVID nineteen, I'm going to assume you know they can because you know for the past five years they're able to do so. So let's say they're able to uh, maintain six cents. So, if we were to like rearrange the formula, so the share price will be equals to dividend received over dividend yield. So, the fair value, so the value which I think is fair based on the 6% pattern, would be the 6 cents dividend divided by the 6% dividend yield to arrive at 1 ringgit. And this chart here, I believe, was like slightly outdated because uh, based on the current moment, I think I checked it was around 99 cents. So it's actually somewhere around the fair value. So if you are really interested in this stock, what you can do would be like you can position your buys in like different tranches. So tranches as in like batches. So instead of like, uh, let's say like you allocated uh, 1,000 for Hapsing, right? Let's say you allocated 1,000. So let's say uh, the fair value is 1 ringgit, you're okay with that. You don't throw in your whole 1,000 ringgit into, you know, into the stock. You position it in such a way that you split it to 
300, 300, 400. So basically, you position it at 30%, 30%, and 40%. Now, why do, why do we do so? We position it in such a way that we actually get to uh, reduce our buying costs. So it's basically dollar cost averaging, DCA. So for the first 30%, perhaps you will buy at one ringgit first. And then for the next 30%, you know, when it drops like maybe to 90% or 80%, you can buy. And then when it drops to the next 40%, then you can buy it cheaper. So at the end of the day, your average price actually goes much, much lower. So yeah, that is all about it to do with Hub Singh. I hope, you know, this video has been able to help you to, you know, roughly see how you would typically evaluate a dividend company because I think Hub Singh is really like a very good benchmark in terms of if you have to like look into other uh, dividend companies which aren't too complex in you know, how Hub Singh is a biscuit company. Now, to recap, we went through like the business model, the product segment, the product geographical segmentation as well, who the you know, board of directors are, how are their remunerations, the moolah in terms of you know, whether they're generating cash flow, how are the uh, gross profit like, the net profit like, do they have debt, you know, things like that, can they actually last out through COVID-19, the alarm bells, you know, whether they are in a saturated marketplace, how they're going to do in the future, you know, in terms of like uh, R and D with biscuit because it takes a long time, right? And of course, the last one we to do with the valuation, where you know what will we, what would be the uh, appropriate uh, target price that you know would be suitable to your appetite. In this case, for me, it will be one ringgit. So yeah, that is all about it. And once again, I like to tell you that you know this is not a recommendation to buy or sell, but rather these are like my personal insights into you know what I think about Hub Singh and I'm also, you know, biased in a way since I'm a Western investor. I've actually had an allocation uh, allotted to it. So yeah, that is all for today. So yeah, if you think this video has been like, you know, a huge bunch of information to you and so it's helped you to learn more, you know, do give it a like, you know, subscribe, click the bell icon as well, you know, share it to your friends, your family or anyone at all. And I hope, you know, everyone gets the benefit from this. That is all for today and happy investing guys. See you next time. This is Cheech signing off from Cheech Reader.